Hello, my name is Michaela McCarthy, and I am the current fellow at Carilion Clinic. I will be discussing small joint and wrist arthroscopy today. To begin with, we will discuss the common portal sites utilized in wrist arthroscopy. Here are several pictorial demonstrations of the more common wrist portals utilized. The standard wrist portals are as follows. The 3-4 portal and 4-5 portal can be utilized interchangeably to visualize the radiocarpal joint and for instrumentation purposes. The 4-5 portal can also be utilized to access the ulnocarpal joint. The 6-R portal is used to access the ulnocarpal joint and the 6U portal is predominantly utilized for outflow purposes. Here is a depiction of the 3, 4, and 4, 5 portals. The 3, 4 portal lies just distal to Lister's tubercle between the EPL and the EDC tendons, while the 4, 5 portal, which is better represented in the right picture, is located in line with the ring finger metacarpal between the EDC and EDM tendons. These two pictures highlight the visualization provided by the 3, 4, and 4, 5 portals. The top photo demonstrates what is visualized in the 3, 4 portal. You will see the proximal aspect of the scaphoid and the distal aspect of the radius, while the lower photo shows the visualization provided by the 4, 5 portal, representing the proximal aspect of the lunate and again, the distal aspect of the radius. The standard mid-carpal portals are the mid-carpal radial and ulnar portal. The mid-carpal radial portal is located one centimeter distal to the 3-4 portal and is bound radially by the ECRB tendon and ulnarly by the EDC tendons, while the mid-carpal ulnar portal is about 1 to 1.5 centimeters distal to the 4-5 portal and is bound by the EDC and the EDM tendons. These cadaveric images demonstrate the relationship between the mid-carpal and the standard wrist portals. The image on the left demonstrates the relationship between the mid-carpal radial portal and the 3-4 portal. As you can see, the mid-carpal radial portal lies just distal to the 3-4 portal. The middle image demonstrates the relationship between the mid-carpal ulnar portal and the 4-5 portal, while the image on the right shows the approximate locations of the 6-U and R portals. An additional factor provided by these cadaveric images are the relationship of the portals with the neighboring tendinous and neurovascular structures. An additional portal not previously discussed is the 1-2 portal. This portal is located between the APL and the ECRB tendons. It is a less often utilized portal however, can provide access to the radial styloid and the radial most aspect of the radial carpal joint. One of the cautions to utilizing the 1-2 portal is the relationship of the portal's location with the radial sensory nerve. The image helps depict the relationship of the radial sensory nerve as it courses along the radial and distal aspect of the forearm and hand. The relationship between the radial sensory nerve and the location of the portal has previously been studied, and they have found that branches of the superficial radial nerve were within a mean of three millimeters from the portal site. Additionally, the radial artery was found to be an average of three millimeters away from the portal site. It is due to the close proximity of the superficial radial nerve and the radial artery that this is a less common portal and is utilized in specific situations. 
the upcoming slides will provide arthroscopic views of what should be visualized from each portal. On this slide, you will see images from the 3-4 portal. The images on top demonstrate the relationship between the radioscaphocapitate and the long radiolunate ligament. The top right photo demonstrates the radioscapholunate ligament as it blends superiorly with the scaphalunate interosseous ligament. The images on the bottom represent the relationship between the radioscaphocapitate ligament, the long radiolunate ligament, and the short radiolunate ligament. You should always be able to identify your radioscaphocapitate ligament and your long radiolunate ligament. Depending on the anatomic variation of your patient, you may or may not be able to identify the radiolunate ligament as that sometimes hides along the volar aspect of the long radiolunate ligament and is not easily visualized from these dorsal portals. Here again is a picture identifying the relationship of the RSC and the long radiolunate ligament utilizing both an x-ray and arthroscopic pictures, highlighting the variation that can be encountered in a scope. Again, these pictures on the left show two views of different patients through the 3-4 portal. And on the right, again, two views from the 4-5 portal. The top images demonstrate a normal appearance of the articular cartilage between the scaphoid and radius and the lunate and radius respectively, while the lower photos demonstrates different levels of osteoarthritic changes that can be encountered. These images demonstrate anatomic structures that are visible through the 4-5 portal as we progress ulnarly across the wrist joint. The top right image demonstrates the ligament of testute or otherwise known as the radioscapholunate ligament. You can see at the distal aspect of the ligament there is some red discoloration, which represents the blending of the radioscaphalunate ligament with the SL interosseous ligament. The image on the top left represents the ulnolunate ligament, and the bottom images are representation of the TFCC, with the bottom left image representing a tear associated with the TFCC exposing the underlying ulnar head. When inspecting the TFCC, it is important to remember what normal can look like. The top image here demonstrates a normal prestyloid recess, which can be confused with a peripheral TFCC tear. It is important to note that most peripheral TFCC tears are observed dorsal to the fovea. Additionally, the pisiform can be seen in up to 60% of arthroscopies. This should not be confused as a pathologic finding. The image on the bottom demonstrates a TFCC tear. It is important when inspecting the TFCC to remember the several components that comprise the TFCC, including the volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments, the ulnocarpal ligaments, including the ulnolunate and the ulnotriquetral ligaments, the ulnar collateral ligament, the ECU subsheath, and both the articular disc and the meniscus homologue. These images represent the Geisler classification for wrist interosseous ligament instability. The top left image demonstrates a Geisler grade one which represents no incongruity or instability. As a recall to one of our prior slides, remember that you can identify the radioscaphalunate ligament as it merges with the SL interosseous ligament. A grade two 
is represented in the top right picture as evidenced by a less than one millimeter gap. A Geisler grade three is a greater than one millimeter gap in the bottom left, and the bottom right represents a Geisler grade four, which is otherwise called a drive-through sign. Here is a table representation of the Geisler classification of wrist interosseous ligament instability. Again, a grade one is attenuation of the interosseous ligament, but no evidence of incongruity. A grade two, again, shows attenuation of the interosseous ligament and has a less than one millimeter gap between the carpal bones. A grade three will have incongruity or step off evident on imaging and the spacing between the carpal bones will be greater than one millimeter, while a grade four has incongruity noted on imaging and has gross instability on manipulation. A grade four allows for passage of the arthroscope between the carpal bones, representing the drive-through sign. This slide will recall the standard 6R and 6U portals. The 6R portal is developed radial to the ECU tendon and is utilized for visualization and instrumentation of the ulnar aspect of the wrist joint, while the 6U portal is located ulnar to the ECU tendon and is predominantly utilized for outflow. The image here depicts correct and incorrect development of the 6R portal. It is critical that the surgeon should palpate the proximal aspect of the triquetrum and place the 6R portal just proximal to this to ensure that the portal is distal to the TFCC. This slide provides arthroscopic images obtained through the 6R portal. The top left image is a view of the piezotriquetral orifice. The right image demonstrates the dorsal capsular attachment to the SL interosseous ligament, and the bottom left image represents a tear of the dorsal aspect of the interosseous ligament and the subsequent instability or incongruity between the carpal bones. Here is a depiction of the arcuate ligament through the midcarpal radial portal. The arcuate ligament is composed of the scaphocapitate and the triquetrohamocapitate ligaments. The arcuate ligament is a critical volar midcarpal stabilizing ligament. Next, we will be discussing accessory portals that could be utilized in wrist arthroscopy. The volar radial or FCR portal is developed in the floor of the FCR tendon sheath at the proximal palmar crease. It is important to make sure that the carpal tunnel is not violated. This portal should reside in a safe zone, which is free from any neurovascular structures. It is developed in the interval between the RSC and the long radiolunate ligaments. The FCR portal is ideal for evaluating the dorsal radiocarpal ligaments and the palmar subregion of the SL ligament. Additionally, it can be utilized to assist with arthroscopic reduction of inner articular fractures. The volar radial midcarpal portal lies approximately one centimeter distal to the FCR portal and can be developed within the same incision. The volar radial midcarpal portal is used to visualize the palmar aspects of the capitate and hamate and allows for visualization of the capitohamate interosseous ligament, which is important for stabilization of the transverse carpal arch. It can also be used to visualize the DIC ligament and for the volar attachment of the arcuate ligament. The volar ulnar portal is developed utilizing a two centimeter longitudinal incision along the ulnar edge of the finger flexor tendons at the proximal wrist crease. The ulnar styloid should represent the proximal aspect of the VU portal. The volar ulnar portal 
should be in the same sagittal plane as the ECU subsheath. This portal penetrates the ulnolunate ligament adjacent to the radial insertion of the TFCC. There is no true safe zone when developing this portal due to the presence of multiple ulnar-based cutaneous nerves to the palm. The VU portal is utilized to view the dorsal radial ulnar ligament, the dorsal wrist capsule, and the pulmonar aspect of the LT ligament. It can aid in repair and debridement of the dorsal TFCC tears, which as a recall to one of our prior slides, the peripheral TFCC tears tend to be found along the dorsal aspect of the fovea. Next, the volar distal radial ulnar or DRUJ portal can be utilized to assess the TFCC foveal attachment and development of this portal lies one half to one centimeter proximal to the ulnocarpal entry point. The dorsal DRUJ portal is utilized for arthroscopic synovectomy of the DRUJ and can be used for wafer resections of the ulnar head. This portal is developed between the interval of the EDC and the EDM tendons. The images here represent placement of the VR or FCR portal and the VU portal. You can see that the VR portal or volar radial portal is developed through the FCR subsheath. The bottom left picture represents a view of the VR portal from the 3-4 portal. So you can see, as we had previously discussed, that the VR portal is developed in the interval between the RSC and the long radiolunate ligaments. The image in B, I think, does a good job of representing the extended incision that is necessary when developing the VU portal, and that is because there is no safe zone with development of the VU portal due to the numerous cutaneous nerve branches. This is a further representation of the volar ulnar portal and its development along the ulnar aspect of the finger flexor tendons allowing for radial retraction of the tendons in order to develop the portal. I thought these images did an excellent job of demonstrating the relationship between the volar ulnar portal and the volar DRUJ portal. You can see that the volar DRUJ portal truly lies less than a centimeter proximal to the VU portal. And again, both of these portals reside just on the ulnar aspect of the finger flexor tendons. I think the image on the right side, labeled B, does a great job of depicting the subtlety between these two portal placements, where you see that the VU or volar ulnar portal is just distal to the TFCC, while the volar DRUJ portal lies just proximal to the TFCC and distal to the ulnar head. The images along the top of this slide represent development of the volar central or volar ulnar portal. Again, this portal is developed utilizing an extended incision secondary to the lack of safe zone due to the cutaneous nerves in this region. Again, the flexor tendons to the fingers are retracted radially. A helpful anatomic landmark for development of this portal is the third inner metacarpal space. This portal should be developed in line with the third inner metacarpal space. Below are images that demonstrate not only the view through this portal, but also the instrumentation that can be performed. Figure D demonstrates a TFCC tear as viewed through the volar portal, while figure E represents a probe through the volar portal, identifying and further mobilizing that TFCC tear. The bottom images 
are viewed through this volar portal and represent instrumentation into the mid-carpal ulnar portal. Here are images as viewed through the volar radial portal, highlighting what the VR portal is best at identifying arthroscopically. The images on the left, the top image represents the normal appearance of the dorsal radiocarpal or DRC ligament, while the images displayed in B and C represent tears of the dorsal radiocarpal ligament. The image on the right represents a tear of the volar aspect of the SL ligament as viewed through the VR portal. These are our final arthroscopic pictures before further diving into the different clinical applications of wrist arthroscopy. The image on the top left demonstrates the capsular insertion onto the arcuate ligament, while the image on the top right represents the DIC or dorsal intercarpal ligament. The bottom left shows a tear of the LT interosseous ligament, which you can still see part of that ligament attached to the triquetrum. And the bottom right shows a view of the DRUJ with the foveal attachment intact. This table is a summation of what has previously been discussed regarding wrist arthroscopy portals and what can anticipated to be visualized through each portal site. However, we will not go into further discussion of this table at this time. Here are two depictions of available wrist arthroscopy setups. Both setups utilize axial traction through finger trap suspension. On average, there is about 10 pounds of traction utilized though more traction can be used if necessary for a more muscular patient or when arthritis has significantly narrowed the joint space. Advances in wrist arthroscopy written by Wolf et al. did a nice job of highlighting the available portal sites and the scope of practice as it has expanded for the wrist arthroscopic surgeon to allow for management of a number of clinical entities, including management of TFCC pathology, carpal instability, and utilization and assisting with fracture reduction. We will begin by discussing the utilization of wrist arthroscopy for ulnar sided wrist disorders. The image provided here was developed by doctors Kakar and Garcia Elias to help physicians stepwise through the numerous etiologies that can be contributing to ulnar sided wrist pain and remembering to break it down into essential components prior to further intervention. This presentation will focus predominantly on the utilization of dry wrist arthroscopy. The table provided demonstrates the advantages and disadvantages between dry and wet wrist arthroscopy. It is important to note when utilizing dry arthroscopy that there is no fluid extravasation. Therefore, the theoretical risk of compartment syndrome is negated. Another advantage is that when performing concomitant open procedures, that the surrounding tissue will not be distended. Therefore, these concomitant procedures should be more easily performed. The synovial villi will not be distended by saline, and there should be fewer obstructions to view. Additionally, without fluid extravasation, Surgeons should be able to develop larger portals and therefore utilize larger instruments. However, without saline, one must be concerned about heat generated, specifically when utilizing a thermal probe or during debridement. The heat generated by a thermal probe or during overzealous debridement could lead to potential thermal injury to surrounding anatomical structures. To help negate this, a technique has been developed of placing a normal saline filled 10 milliliter syringe into the side port of the arthroscope. 
and using the suction of the shaver or burr to create a closed system to irrigate the joint. This also can be beneficial in helping prevent blockage of suction. The TFCC is a critical anatomic feature of the ulnar aspect of the wrist, and therefore it is imperative to know how to inspect the TFCC during arthroscopy. We will discuss three tests. One is the trampoline test, which is performed utilizing a probe. Pressure is placed utilizing a probe along the central aspect of the TFCC. If intact, the TFCC should become spontaneously taut when pressure is applied. However, if there is a peripheral or foveal tear, the central portion of the TFCC will be soft and pliable. The hook test can be used to determine if there is a foveal detachment representing a Palmer 1B type lesion. This test is performed by inserting a probe and applying traction on the TFCC from ulnar to radial. The test is considered to be positive for a tear if the ulnar aspect of the TFCC is pulled radial and distally. Finally, the suction sign was developed and discussed by doctors Green and Kakar and is helpful in identifying Palmer peripheral 1B tears that are scarred in and are unable to be assessed utilizing the hook test. The suction sign can also be utilized to verify successful repair of peripheral TFCC tears. The suction sign is performed by applying suction with a shaver on the TFCC. If the sign is positive, the TFCC will lift up toward the suction tip. As previously mentioned, there are accessory portals which allow for direct visualization of the DRUJ. Visualization of the DRUJ will allow the surgeon to inspect the sigmoid notch, the distal aspect of the ulna, the undersurface of the TFCC, and the proximal component of the TFCC. Here is a table representation of the Palmer classification for tears within the TFCC, we will be focusing on the traumatic lesions, which are represented as class 1A through D. Treatment of TFCC tears is dependent upon the type of tear and location of the tear. For Palmer type 1, which are traumatic lesions, consistent with a A or central location or D, representing a radial avulsion. Those are best treated with TFCC debridement, while peripheral tears are best treated with TFCC per repair. Again, peripheral tears tend to occur along the dorsal aspect of the TFCC. A repair technique for dorsal peripheral tears consists of elongating the 6R portal which is located along the radial aspect of the ECU tendon. Following development of that incision, you release the retinaculum and retract the ECU tendon ulnarly. A curved or straight 18 gauge needle is then introduced through the floor of the ECU tendon sheath and through the torn TFCC under arthroscopic guidance. Then two or three mattress sutures can be placed and tied down over the floor of the sixth extensor compartment in order to repair that peripheral tear. The illustration provided here demonstrates an outside in technique for repair of a peripheral TFCC tear. However, it is important to note that there are also inside out and all inside methods available for TFCC repairs. When performing a TFCC repair, it is critical to acknowledge concomitant pathology present. For individuals that have isolated TFCC treatment without addressing associated ulnar pathology tend to have worse outcomes when the TFCC is addressed in isolation.
when a foveal avulsion has occurred, that should also be repaired. Again, a two centimeter longitudinal incision needs to be developed along the ulnar aspect of the ulnar cortex. This incision should begin about one centimeter proximal to the tip of the ulnar styloid. A 21 gauge needle should be passed dorsal to the ulnar styloid and deep to the ECU tendon in order to evaluate the proper obliquity of the upcoming bone tunnels. Once that has been determined, two separate holes are made utilizing a 1.5 millimeter K wire from the ulnar cortex into the fovea. Then, non-absorbable sutures are passed through the two 21 gauge needles, both into the tunnel and into the evolved TFCC. Proximal traction is applied to the mattress suture to pull the TFCC down into the fovea. That suture is then tied with the forearm in neutral rotation to stabilize the DRUJ. A DRUJ accessory portal can also be utilized in conjunction in order to check that appropriate reinsertion of the TFCC into the fovea has occurred. The images provided below demonstrate a bare foveal area and following a TFCC repair. And finally, TFCC reconstruction. Reconstruction is indicated when the TFCC is considered irreparable and there is the presence of symptomatic DRUJ instability. Dry wrist arthroscopy is more appropriate specifically in the setting of TFCC reconstruction because there is a need for larger portals in order to pass the tendon graft. If one was utilizing wet arthroscopy, there would be concern for extravasation. Ulnocarpal impaction syndrome occurs in the setting of ulnar positive variants, leading to the development of a central TFCC tear without associated DRUJ instability. The image on the right depicts a patient with ulnocarpal impaction syndrome and the associated degenerative tear of the central aspect of the TFCC. It is important to remember that the central TFCC tear cannot be addressed in isolation. One must remember to address the ulnar positive variants simultaneously or the patient will have worse postoperative outcomes. In the setting of ulnar positive variants less than four millimeters, it is recommended that the patient undergo a simultaneous arthroscopic wafer procedure. When performing this procedure utilizing dry arthroscopy, Surgeons can use a larger portal and therefore can utilize a larger burr to perform the resection in a more expedient fashion. The surgeon needs to remember to pronate and supinate the radius around the ulna when performing the wafer resection to ensure that the resection is appropriately contoured. It is recommended that the automated washout technique be utilized. As a reminder, this technique involves placing a 10 milliliter syringe full of saline on the arthroscope to ensure that the debris is removed from the onal carpal joint and to prevent overheating of the instruments. Thus far, we have been focusing exclusively on arthroscopic management of TFCC tears. This study looks at the postoperative outcomes of open and arthroscopic TFCC repairs. It is important to note that the TFCC functions both as a cushion for the ulnar aspect as the wrist, but also as a stabilizer of the DRUJ. Therefore, injury to the TFCC can not only result in pain, but also DRUJ instability. When do TFCC tears occur? They can occur traumatically, but it is important to remember that asymptomatic TFCC tears become more common as we age. This study 
focused on palmar type 1 tears, which are traumatic tears as previously discussed. This illustration represents the four different kinds of palmar type 1 acute TFCC tears. This study determined that open and arthroscopic TFCC repairs had similar postoperative complications involving injury to the dorsal sensory nerve, ECU tendonitis, persistent DRUJ instability, and recurrent pain. Ultimately, TFCC repair, regardless of treatment technique, resulted in improved pain scores and functional outcomes. Neither technique was superior. Now we will focus on radial sided wrist disorders. As demonstrated in the illustration, we will initially focus on distal radius fractures. The ideal time frame to perform a dry wrist arthroscopy is within one week of injury because the fracture hematoma can be readily irrigated from the joint. Arthroscopy can be performed either horizontally or vertically as previously depicted. Often, the distal ulnar head does not have an associated injury. Therefore, the surgeon can utilize the 6R portal. As demonstrated in the illustration, you can see the benefit associated with the 6R portal. The 6R portal enables the surgeon to look across the distal radius articular surface without impeding fracture reduction. However, it is important that the surgeon does not rest the arthroscope on the lunate facet of the radius, otherwise the arthroscope can result in fracture displacement. As shown in the illustration, if the surgeon attempts to utilize the 3-4 portal, the arthroscope can impede fracture reduction and does not allow for full visualization of the articular surface. Abe and Fuji have previously studied 248 intraarticular distal radius fractures. They found adequate reduction under fluoroscopic control. However, 21% of their patients had articular step off or gap of two millimeters, and 9% of their patients had unrecognized fracture fragments noted during arthroscopy that were not previously detected with either preoperative x-rays or CT scans. 41% of their patients were found to have an associated TFCC tear, and 33% of their patients had an associated SL ligament injury. At an average follow-up of 15 months, 98% of their patients determined to have either excellent or good outcomes with arthroscopic assisted open reduction internal fixation of their distal radius fractures. Here are two arthroscopic images obtained during distal radius fracture reduction. As you can see in figure five, where the probe lies, there is a malreduction of the articular surface, while in figure six, you see that the articular surface has been restored. Now we will discuss the ability of arthroscopy to assist with scaphoid fracture management. The images depicted here demonstrate a scaphoid non-union, followed by non-union debridement and maintenance of the cartilage shell of the scaphoid. Wrist arthroscopy provides an unparalleled view of the fracture without associated soft tissue stripping or potential devascularization that can occur with open surgery. Also, arthroscopy allows for evaluation of the injury, a status of the union, and permits assessment of the reduction in addition to evaluation of the associated cartilage and intercarpal ligaments. Dry arthroscopy is particularly advantageous in the management of scaphoid non-unions as it permits delivery of bone graft within the fracture site given the larger portals that can be utilized and retention of its osteogenic factors without fear of losing the graft with irrigation. These procedures can take several hours, so utilizing dry wrist arthroscopy, there is a lack of fluid extravasation a disadvantage of dry wrist arthroscopy is the need for use of a tourniquet, which inhibits the ability to assess intraoperative punctate bleeding unless the tourniquet is deflated. Additionally, there is potential heat generation from the arthroscope light source. The outcomes of arthroscopic assisted scaphoid internal fixation 
has been studied several times. Dr. Shi et al. reported the outcomes of 15 acute scaphoid fractures treated via arthroscopic assisted internal fixation. They noted that 13% of their patients had an associated SL injury, 27% LT injury, 33% TFCC injury, 33% with an RSC or long radial lunate ligament injury, and 40% had associated chondral fractures. However, they also noted a 100% union rate with 11 of their 15 patients noting excellent outcomes and four noting good outcomes as identified with the Mayo modified risk scores with an average follow-up of two years. Slade et al. reported the outcomes on 15 patients with scaphoid non-unions that did not have associated collapse or humpback deformity. They noted a 100% union rate at an average of 14 weeks after surgery. However, patients with non-unions that were present for greater than six months had a slower rate to union. This outcome was reinforced with Geisler's study, which demonstrated the outcomes following management of cystic non-unions without humpback deformity. In the Geisler study, 14 of the 15 cystic non-unions went on to union following arthroscopic assisted repair. As previously mentioned, when performing dry wrist arthroscopy, a tourniquet is necessitated, which impedes the ability to assess for punctate bleeding. However, figure 10 demonstrates the tourniquet has been deflated and the presence of punctate bleeding can now be visualized. Figure 11 demonstrates the delivery of autogenous bone graft through the mid-carpal radial portal directly into the scaphoid non-union site. Next, we will discuss thumb CMC arthritis. The images on the left depict the eaton littler classification. As a reminder, stage one is slight joint space widening. Stage two is slight narrowing with sclerosis and osteophyte development less than two millimeters. Stage three is marked narrowing with sclerosis and osteophytes greater than two millimeters. And stage four is pantrapezial arthritis. So how do we perform? arthroscopy of the CMC joint. It is most commonly performed utilizing the 1R and the 1U portal. The 1R portal is on the radial side of the abductor pollicis longus and the 1U portal is between the extensor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. The radial portal is mainly utilized to assess the joint cartilage as well as the dorsal ligaments while the ulnar portal is helpful to visualize the volar ligaments. Once inside the joint, you can assess arthroscopically the status of the joint surfaces and utilize the BADIA classification. The BADIA classification has three stages. Stage one is diffuse synovitis, intact articular cartilage and volar capsular laxity. Stage two is central focal articular cartilage loss of trapezium, deep metacarpal base loss, and synovitis. Stage three is widespread articular cartilage loss and deep osteophyte development on the trapezium. Arthroscopy is most beneficial in the earlier stages of arthritis. What do you do following establishment of the portals? You introduce an aggressive shaver to perform a synovectomy and a capsular reflection. It is essential to remove the loose bodies and the capsular folds, especially in the inner metacarpal pouch. This is mandatory because loose bodies are a common cause of painful locking joints, especially those painful locking joints that appear well preserved on x-ray. You may then inspect the joint surfaces. If arthritis is noted, it is particularly important to expose that palmar osteophyte as depicted in figure 20, which is generally located just proximal to the joint line and can be debrided arthroscopically, resulting in reduction of the CMC joint. Furia et al. compared 23 patients with stage one or two arthritic disease which were treated arthroscopically 
with debridement and synovectomy to a control group of 21 patients which were treated non-surgically. At one year post-op, the surgical group had significant improvements in pain and grip excuse me, pinch strength, with 83% of surgical patients reporting good to excellent outcomes. An additional study was performed by Wilkins and colleagues looking at a systematic review regarding the arthroscopic management of basilar thumb arthritis and concluded that visual analog scores for pain improved by four points, dash by 22 points, and grip strength by 2.8 kilograms therefore indicating that arthroscopy is a good supplementation for our treatment algorithm of early CMC arthritis. Next, we will discuss SL ligament injuries and the spectrum on which injuries can occur and the available treatment modalities. When managing SL ligament injuries and associated instability, it is important to determine the significance of the instability. The bottom table is the Garcia Elias classification, which has providers step through six questions in order to stage the significance of the SL instability. The top table breaks down instability into pre-dynamic, dynamic, and static correlates that clinical finding with their arthroscopic Geisler grading, which we had previously discussed, and then provides a recommended treatment option. The first study we will discuss is outcomes after wrist arthroscopy for the treatment of SL pre-dynamic instability in the young active patient. The instability was treated with non-ablative thermal shrinkage. Individuals were included in this study if they had dorsal wrist pain associated with hyperextension that was not responsive to non-surgical management for a minimum of six weeks. All patients had bilateral wrist radiographs, which demonstrated no evidence of dynamic instability. All patients had pain with a Watson scaphoid shift test, but none of them had a dynamic clunk. As you can see in the provided tables, the mean age of patients was 29, and for patients who underwent the arthroscopy, the majority of them had a Geisler grade one or two. The tables provided here indicate their post-operative outcomes. 86% of patients were able to return to duty. All patients who returned to full duty did so at their same job capacity. Those who did not return to full duty either continued their military employment in a limited capacity or were separated from the military. The 79% who returned to push-ups represents 11 of the 14 patients. With regards to pain with activity at their two-year follow-up, there was a significant improvement in their visual analog pain scale score. Next, we will discuss the application of arthroscopic SL ligament repair and dorsal capsulodesis with suture anchor in acute and subacute SL disassociation. This study included 19 young patients with symptomatic SL ligament tears within three months of injury over a period of January 2017 to January 2020, which were followed up for a minimum of two years. The illustration depicted here represents their surgical procedure of SL ligament repair in addition to that dorsal capsulodesis. These images demonstrate their recommended technique. Initially, a loop suture is passed via a needle through the dorsal capsule, partial dorsal radiocarpal ligament, an SL ligament to the mid-carpal joint from the 3-4 portal, a 1.3 millimeter all suture anchor is applied to the proximal and dorsal aspect of the scaphoid. A limb of this fiber wire is sent to the mid-carpal joint and passed through the loop suture. The limb of the fiber wire is then pulled back to the radiocarpal joint by the loop suture. The SL ligament is sutured back to the scaphoid bone.
and then the SL and SC joints were fixed with K wires. This table represents the post-operative outcomes of the 19 patients followed in this study. They were followed for an average of 26.5 months. At the minimum two-year follow-up, patients' VAS pain score and grip force improved significantly. There was a 14.7% strength increase compared to preoperatively. The mean modified Mayo wrist score was 90.1 points which was found to be a significant improvement compared to pre-op. There was an average loss of 5.1 degrees total arc of motion in the flexion extension plane. One patient was noted to have recurrent SL instability at 15 months necessitating SL ligament reconstruction. Otherwise, 18 of the 19 patients reported good or excellent postoperative outcomes at two years postoperatively. This recent article published in the Journal of Hand Surgery strives to provide treatment recommendations based upon existing classification systems. Again, this table represents the Garcia and Elias staging system for SL ligament injuries. It walks through the seven stages, which represent the spectrum of SL ligament injuries, beginning with a partial SL ligament injury and ending with a slack wrist. The table provided below utilizes an additional classification system to evaluate SL ligament injuries. This classification system is based upon the ligamentous injuries associated with the different clinical findings of SL ligament injuries, starting with predynamic or occult injuries, which represent a partial injury to the SL ligament and progressing stepwise until finally the development of the slack wrist, which represents an injury not only to the SL ligament, but the STT ligament, the dorsal intercarpal ligaments, and the long radial lunate ligament. It is trying to correlate the findings found on imaging with the ligamentous structures that are injured. Through Dr. Wessel's and Dr. Wolf's study of scaphalunate instability, there has been increased importance noted on preservation of the insertions of the dorsal ligament complex on the lunate's bare area or the dorsal non-articular portion of the lunate. In order to protect this bare area, they recommend utilizing a capsular opening that parallels and is distal to the dorsal radiocarpal ligament. In their experience, they found that this window approach allows the wrist adequate visualization of the SL interval for repair in the majority of circumstances. However, if a more extensive approach is necessitated, you can detach the dorsal intercarpal or dorsal radiocarpal ligaments However, these need to be repaired via suture anchor at the end of the procedure in order to reestablish continuity of these ligaments. The image provided below represents their recommended window approach with preservation of the DIC and DRC ligaments. In part two of their scaphalunate instability study, they strive to provide treatment recommendations based upon the pre-existing Garcia and Elias staging and the ligamentous structures that are injured in order to result in that level of SL ligament instability. The Garcia Elias stage one or EWAS stage two represents an occult injury. This means that there are no abnormalities of the scaphoid or lunate posture on static or stress imaging. However, the patient does have pain, which results with loading, secondary to the subtle changes of the kinematics between the scaphoid and the lunate. On physical exam, the patient will have tenderness 
over the dorsal aspect of the SL ligament interval, and they will have pain associated with this Watson scaphoid shift test. However, the test will be negative for associated translation. At this stage, they recommend initial management with non-surgical modalities, including immobilization, NSAIDs, or therapy. With regards to therapy, there are a number of neuromuscular protocols that are currently being investigated. However, it is yet to be determined which of these protocols is most effective. If the patient were to fail non-operative intervention, then could proceed with surgical intervention in the form of either arthroscopic inspection and debridement or thermal shrinkage. Thermal shrinkage would be performed at the distal edge of the volar SL and interosseous ligament and the radioscaphocapitate ligament in order to tighten these attenuated ligaments with or without the need for temporary percutaneous K-wire stabilization of the SL and scaphocapitate joints. Next, Garcia Elias stage two or EWAS stage three represent dynamic injuries these dynamic injuries are the result of a dorsal SL ligament rupture, which may be accompanied by subtotal or complete tears of the membranous and volar components of the SL ligament. In addition, this dynamic instability may be accompanied by partial or complete detachment of the dorsal ligament complex, which is composed of the DIC, DRC, and the dorsal scaphotriquetral ligament from the lunate. Of note, there are no resting postural changes of the carpus. However, there may be noted to be SL diastasis on pencil grip x-ray or asymmetric scaphoid or lunate motion during radial to ulnar deviation under fluoroscopy. Dynamic instability is characterized by both coronal and sagittal plane abnormalities under stress examination. Therefore, the treatment procedure must stress the, address the instability in both the coronal and sagittal planes. It is recommended that not only the dorsal SL ligament be reattached, but an additional procedure be performed to manage the sagittal plane instability. Available procedures include the dorsal capsulodesis, the dorsal capsular ligamentous SL septum repair, and the repair and augmentation of dorsal intercarpal ligament repair to the dorsal lunate. The results of these repairs with or without capsulodesis are most effective when they are completed within six weeks of injury. They are less effective for chronic injuries and surgeon selection of these dorsal procedures depends on surgeon preference. There has not been definitive superiority demonstrated at this time. Garcia Elias stage three represents SL dissociation. That is the loss of synchronous motion of the scaphoid and lunate with widening of the SL interval. This requires more than division of the SL ligament and includes disruption of the scaphoid or lunate insertions of the DIC, disruption of the long radial lunate, and or disruption of the dorsal scaphotriquetral ligament. Typically, the STT ligament remains intact at this stage, maintaining a normal radio scaphoid angle. Treatment of this without a repairable SL ligament necessitates ligament reconstruction. Ligament reconstruction with a tendon graft is available in a number of techniques, including an all dorsal internal brace augmentation, the three ligament tenodesis or LTL, the bone retinaculum bone implantation, the scapholunate intercarpal ligamentoplasty, along with several other procedures. The results of these procedures have had significant variation. 
There has been noted to be improved pain scores at midterm follow-up with most types of SL ligament reconstruction, but the preservation of motion and the long-term maintenance of alignment continue to be problematic and no definitive ligament reconstruction technique has been identified as superior. Stage four represents scaphoid rotary subluxation, which results from complete disruption of the SL ligament in combination with injury or attenuation of the STT and SC ligaments distally and injury to the dorsal ligament complex attachments to the scaphoid. Patients with this presentation will have a positive scaphoid shift test and will be noted to have dorsal subluxation of the scaphoid. With regards to treatment, it is important that a tendon graft procedure be performed in order to reconstruct the damaged ligamentous complexes, including the dorsal SL ligament, the STT ligaments, and the portions of the dorsal ligament complex. The image in figure two represents the triligament tenodesis. This is performed utilizing the flexor carpi radialis tendon as it emerges from the dorsal SL ligament insertion site and is secured with an anchor in a dorsal trough in the lunate to reconstruct the dorsal SL ligament. The remaining graft is then routed through the DRC ligament and sutured back on itself. The most common complication with this procedure is osteoarthritis. There are a number of other surgical techniques available for reconstruction of the damaged ligamentous complexes. Again, there have been no perspective or multi-center studies which have demonstrated superiority of any of the repair methods available for stage four instability. Garcia Elias stage five dash six represents DC deformity and it being either reducible stage five or irreducible stage six. The DC deformity represents an abnormal rotation of the lunate following complete SL ligament rupture, injury to the STT ligament complex, and the lunate attachment of the DIC. The occurrence of DC deformity allows for the distal carpal row to translate dorsally and rotate into pronation. A comprehensive understanding of the disrupted ligaments is critical in order to obtain a satisfactory treatment plan and outcome. Simply addressing the underlying SL ligament injury will be inadequate. For stage five, Garcia Elias DC deformities, which are reducible, it is recommended that there be a reconstruction of both the dorsal and palmar stabilizing ligaments that have been disrupted. One procedure that has been developed to address the volar and dorsal injured ligaments is the anafab procedure or the anatomic front and back procedure. This is a volar and dorsal reconstructive procedure that was conceptualized based on the concept of carpal kinematics. The procedure reconstructs the STT complex, the dorsal SL ligament, the DIC, and the long radial lunate ligament using a tendon graft. This tendon graft is augmented with synthetic tape in order to remove the, necess the necessity for K wires. The anafab has been demonstrated to be the only available repair that improves all five parameters of disruption with a DC deformity. However, further clinical outcome studies are necessary to determine the long-term outcomes of this procedure for late chronic instability. 
stage 6 represents an irreducible DC deformity with proximal row malalignment. This malalignment is unable to be corrected secondary to joint subluxation, fibrosis, and capsular contracture. The reducibility of the intercalated segment is determined by a lateral radiograph, which is taken in maximum wrist flexion or by a four dynamic CT. Four treatment options available for irreducible DC deformity. You can start with initial non-operative management for patients that have minimal symptoms or or are of a low activity level. For those that are non-responsive to non-operative management, a next step would include consideration of an anterior and posterior interosseous nerve denervation and ultimately a salvage procedure. Unfortunately, a reconstruction would be unsuccessful secondary to the inability to reduce the malalignment. Salvage procedure options include a proximal row carpectomy, which is represented in the image on the slide, a scapholunate fusion, a scaphocapitate fusion, a scaphoid excision, or a four-corner arthrodesis. The image in figure five represents additional salvage procedures that are available in the setting of stage six, Garcia Elias deformity. The images represented here depict a radioscaphalunate fusion with a distal scaphoidectomy. Finally, Garcia Elias stage 7, which represents SL advanced collapse or scaphalunate advanced collapse slack, which is the last stage of progressive SL instability and results from the abnormal shear stresses. Stage 1 of slack wrist represents arthritis between the scaphoid and the radial styloid. Stage 2 progresses to proximal scaphoid cartilage loss, encompassing the scaphoid facet. And stage three is the result of cartilage erosion along the proximal capitate, resulting in arthritis between the capitate and lunate. Available treatment options should start with non-surgical modalities, including bracing, NSAIDs, and corticosteroid injections. When non-operative treatment modalities are no longer effective, then surgeons can proceed with surgical intervention. Surgical intervention is based upon the slack stage at presentation and will not be discussed in further detail for this talk. Thank you for your time and attention during this extensive talk that highlighted only a few of the diagnoses which can be managed arthroscopically. I hope this talk encourages further exploration of the power and applicability of wrist and small joint arthroscopy. Again, thank you for your time.